Today I want to share with you how to make a brown beef stock. This is an easy technique to learn and I'm going to share all my best tips with you so that you can create a very flavorful base that you can then go on to use to make restaurant quality sauces and traditional French onion soup. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary from marysnest.com and author of the Modern Pioneer Cookbook and welcome to my kitchen. Alrighty, let's get started. Alrighty, now let's go over the ingredients. Now if we were just making a simple beef stock, all you would need would be these marrow bones and a few aromatics. However, because we're making a brown beef stock, we also need some meat. Now what I've got here are basically considered meaty bones. I have beef shanks and I like to use meat on the bone because the bone, like the marrow bones, brings nutrition to our brown beef stock. But the meat surrounding the bones of these beef shanks is going to brown beautifully in the oven and that's what is going to give us the lovely brown color of a brown beef stock. Now a simple stock will be lighter in color and lighter in flavor. It still can be used to make sauces, generally lighter sauces, and it can also be used as a base for soups. Now, when we turn this into a brown stock, it becomes darker in color, richer in flavor, and much more restaurant quality like. If you've ever been at a restaurant where you had a steak with maybe a sauce on it, chances are the chef had used a brown stock to make that sauce. And that's why it's so delicious because brown stock is extremely rich in flavor. It's very concentrated. But not only can it be used to make sauces, it can also be used as a base for soups. But traditionally, because of the flavor being so rich, it's used to make French onion soup which has that beautiful deep rich brown flavor and all of these bones contain collagen which is going to leach out into the liquid as we make our stock and that collagen once cooked is gelatin and that's why we're going to wind up with a beautifully gelatinous stock now, if you've ever wondered what's the difference between broth, stock, and bone broth, I have a very detailed video on that, and I'll be sure to link to it in the description below underneath this video. So you're going to need three pounds of beef marrow bones and three pounds of some type of meaty beef bones. I've got the beef shanks. Short ribs would also work very well. Now, if you can't find meaty bones like shanks or short ribs, don't worry about it. You can use other cuts of beef. You could use cubed chuck or something like that. And even though you don't have the bones, don't worry because you do have all of these marrow bones. Next, you're going to want two celery stalks, two carrots, one whole onion with the skin on. You can have a white onion, a yellow onion, a red onion, doesn't really matter. Next, you're going to want some herbs. I've got some fresh thyme here and I also have two dry basil leaves. Next, you're gonna want about a quarter cup of tomato paste and optionally, one cup of port. And port is a fortified wine if you're new to cooking with spirits. And basically why I like to use fortified wines is they generally come in bottles with a screw top and they don't turn into vinegar like an open bottle of wine might because they've been fortified, usually with a sweetener, and that prevents them from turning into vinegar. So they're wonderful for cooking. But that is completely optional if you prefer uh, not to use any alcohol. But it does, the alcohol will cook off and the, and the stock will ultimately have a lovely flavor to it, but you can certainly just use water. And speaking of water, that's the last ingredient that you're going to need and you're going to just use the amount of water that covers all of your ingredients. No more, no less. Now I like to use port. I find it has a very good flavor. You could always use vermouth or dry sherry. Different fortified wines like that will work as well. And the reason we're using this, or if you're just using a cup of water, is because we're going to deglaze our pan after we brown our bones and meat. Now, speaking of pan, let's talk about the equipment that you're going to need to make this brown beef stock. 
Now what I've got here is a baking pan. Some may know it as a half sheet pan or a jelly roll pan. The reason I like to use this is the more shallow the pan, the quicker and better our meat and bones will roast. If you don't have a baking pan like this, you can use a roasting pan. You just want to use a shallow roasting pan. That will get you your best color on your bones and on your meat. If you have a very deep roasting pan, you're probably just going to have to roast the bones and the meat a little longer. Now, I don't use any salt or any black peppercorns when I make a brown beef stock because I want the flavor to be very flexible based on what I'm going to use this for when making a sauce or making a traditional French onion soup. So I recommend that you leave out salt and pepper. The next thing we're going to do is take our tomato paste and we're going to spread some across the meaty bones as well as the marrow bones. The reason that we do this is because it helps to caramelize the meat and the bones to get as rich a color and flavor as possible. So I'm just going to go ahead and spread some of this on each piece, on each piece of these lovely beef shanks and then I'll go ahead and also spread it across the top of the marrow bones. Now that I've got everything covered with the tomato paste, I'm going to set this aside and we're going to cut up our onion and our carrots. We're not going to put our celery into the oven because at 450 degrees, celery is more of a delicate vegetable and so I don't want it to burn. So, but all we're going to do is just a rough chop just in a size that we can squeeze in and around the meat and bones. You do not need to peel your carrots. You don't need to get fancy at all. And as a matter of fact, if you've been with me for a while and you have your scrap bag, this is a great time to pull that out. And you can use some of your carrot shavings. You can use some of your onion skins. All of that will work well. Now I'm just going to cut up my onion and we are not going to remove the skin. The onion skin has flavor and it has nutrition. Now, if you do want to use a peeled onion, just don't throw away the skin. Add it to your scrap bag. Now all you want to do is just find places amongst the meat and bones where you can wedge in your onions and your carrots. And the reason that we're putting these in with the bones and the meaty bones, the marrow bones and the meaty bones, is because we want them to brown up too. Because the more browning, the more caramelization of both the vegetables and the meat, the better color we're going to have as well as richer flavor in our end product. Now that we've got all our onions and carrots nestled in among our bones, we're going to go ahead and put this into our oven, 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're going to keep an eye on these, but they are going to roast in probably about 30 minutes. Well, at the 15 minute mark, I opened the oven door, flipped everything, put it back in, closed the oven door, and let it go for another 15 minutes. At 30 minutes, I felt it needed a little more time to brown up, so I would say my bones were in the oven for maybe about 35 minutes. But you always want to check, everybody's oven is different, so you always want to take a peek at about 25 minutes, but know that you may need the full 30 minutes or even up to maybe 40 minutes. Now you're going to need a stock pot that can hold all of your bones and the other ingredients and enough water to cover everything. What I've got here is about a 10 quart enameled stock pot. Now I'm just going to go ahead and start putting these bones into our stock pot. Now if you've been with me a while and you've made bone broth, you probably see a lot of similarities uh, in making this stock. And there are a lot of similarities between making stock and what today we call bone broth. The only real differences, and as I said, I have that video for you where I go into a lot more detail, but the biggest difference uh, when it comes to broth stock and bone broth is that broth is generally just made with meaty bones, a lot of meat, even in many cases a whole chicken if you're making chicken broth. Whereas stock is generally made, a simple stock is generally just made uh, with bones that have very little meat on them. And then bone broth is generally made with marrow bones, bones that don't have a lot of meat on them but have the marrow. Uh, 
and meaty bones like shanks. But the third magical, so to speak, ingredient are high cartilage bones like oxtails or patellas or knuckle bones, things like that. Those are what really make a beautifully gelatinous liquid. And why do we want a, ge a gelatinous liquid? Is because the gelatin in bone broth nourishes our digestive tract. And scientists tell us if we have a well-nourished digestive tract, it makes a very hospitable environment for good bacteria to flourish. And the more good bacteria we have, the healthier we are. Now, in the case of this brown stock, we're adding in the meaty bones. We're not adding in the high cartilage bones, although some people might use oxtails in place of beef shanks. And so you're kind of getting closer on that continuum, so to speak, of creating a bone broth. But what's nice about a brown stock like this is this is extremely flavorful, number one. And number two, it can become very gelatinous because it's often reduced down into something that looks very much like jello. I think that's something that chefs will do. Uh, and then you have, they'll have what I believe is called like a demi-glace. And so you have this beautiful, thick, concentrated brown stock that can literally be scooped out on a spoon and then put into a stock, you know, a, a saucepan, whatever you're doing to work as the base for making your sauce. The bottom line is that broths are often used as a base for very simple soups. You often will see a whole chicken used to make a wonderful homemade chicken soup. Whereas stocks are often used to make sauces, while bone broth is often simply used as a sipping broth. Although there's a lot more you can do with bone broth than just drink it. And I have a video where I go into a lot of detail with you with a lot of options for the different things that you can do with bone broth. And I'll be sure to link to that below. But know that whether you're making a broth, a stock, a bone broth, or in our case, a brown beef stock, which is more concentrated than just a simple stock and is going to make restaurant quality sauces as well as the base for traditional French onion soup, which I'm gonna be sharing that recipe with you in the future. Know that these are all wonderful tools for the traditional home cook. So if you've not seen my videos on making bone broth and how to make, as well as how to make a simple broth and as well as how to make a simple stock, be sure to check those out and add those into your repertoire because they're going to make your food so delicious, but not only delicious, it's going to make it nutritious. And that's really the bottom line uh, for those of us who are traditional foods home cooks. We want to make our food nutritious. Now, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and pour what's on this baking sheet into my stock pot. Some people will transfer the fat at this point to a different vessel. I don't like to do that. The fat has a lot of flavor and it also has some brown bits mixed into it and I don't want to lose those. So I like to go ahead and pour in the fat and then we'll defat it at the end. I'll show you how to do that. And you have multiple options. Now uh, I'm going to take a cup of port if you are using vermouth or dry sherry, those will work too. Or if you just want to use a little water, what I recommend is that you put a little bit of some acidic uh, liquid into your water. You could put a little apple cider vinegar, you could put a little citrus juice, just something that does uh, provide some acid. And the reason that you want to do this is as we're simmering this, we want to extract as much collagen out of those bones as possible. And an acidic medium like a wine or a fortified wine, and I may not have mentioned that earlier, if you are a drinker and you do have wine in your home and you have a bottle that you've opened and you want to use wine, you can certainly use that. But as I said, this is a fortified wine. Uh, we don't drink. And so I find that those are very useful to have on hand because I can store them in my pantry and not worry about them turning into vinegar. But the bottom line is that you want to make sure that if you're just going to deglaze your pan 
with water that you do add maybe a tablespoon or two of apple cider vinegar or some type of citrus. Lemon juice, even orange juice can work. So now what I'm going to do is just go ahead and deglaze this pan best that I can. And all you have to do at this point is just get some sort of flat spatula, a spoon, whatever you have, and start to slowly work off the brown bits, which are known as fond, on the bottom of this pan. Some may not loosen immediately, but as they are softened by this liquid, they will start to loosen. And we're gonna get all these wonderful bits and pour them into our stock pot. Now that I've scraped up the bulk of the brown bits and pretty much loosened everything best I could, I'm gonna go ahead and pour this into my stock pot. Then I'm just gonna scrape the last of these bits off of my baking sheet and I'm gonna add these to my stock pot. Alrighty, now I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the stock pot. Now what I'm gonna do is tie up my thyme. I just have a bunch of fresh thyme here and my bay leaves are dry. And I'm gonna go ahead and tie these together and drop them into the stock pot. Now, you may like to put this all in cheesecloth or maybe you have one of those little cotton reusable spice bags. Uh, rather than just tying it up like this with kitchen twine, kitchen twine and throwing it into uh, your stock pot uh, because maybe you're concerned about all the little thyme leaves that are going to come off in, and be floating around in your stock. I don't worry about that because I'm going to strain this very well. You'll see uh, when we get to that point exactly what I do. And I like to strain my brown stock really well so that it's not clarified in the sense of the way a chef would do it, but clarified sufficiently for a home cook who then wants to go and use this base, this brown stock, this brown beef stock as a base for traditional French onion soup. Now all I'm gonna do is just give the celery a rough chop and we'll go ahead and put that right into our stock pot. Next, I'm gonna cover everything with enough water just to cover. We don't want to put too much water in. We just wanna make sure that everything is sufficiently covered just by no more than maybe an inch. Then don't worry, things will possibly float. That's fine. Just as long as your bones have enough water in them uh, to be covered. So that took the entire container of water, which was one gallon, and now everything's covered, but just covered. And I don't mean to be so repetitive about that, but this is very important that everything is just covered. Too much water and you wind up with a watery stock. And the same rules apply to bone broth. You wind up with a watery bone broth that does not become gelatinous. And we want a nice, rich stock. Now I'm gonna bring this over to my stovetop and we're gonna bring this up to a boil on high heat. Once it hits the boil, we're gonna immediately turn it down to low and we're gonna skim off any foam that floats to the top. Then we're gonna allow this to simmer for four to five hours on the lowest setting. Now after simmering this for about four or five hours, you're gonna notice that some of the liquid has evaporated, that's a good thing, and the color of the liquid has intensified to a dark brown. Now I'm gonna use my little spider strainer here, and I'm gonna start taking out all of the solids. Now I wanna take a minute to talk to you about the meat and the bones. Do not throw out this meat, the meat that came off the beef shanks. You can chop this up and put it in like a nice beef and barley soup. You can put it into tacos. You can put it into a casserole. There's a lot you can do with it. So make sure that you do save all of this meat. Now with the marrow bones, number one, you want to remove the marrow and save it. I'm going to show you how to do that. And number two, you want to save the bones. If you think you're gonna be making a beef bone broth in the next few days, you can keep them in your refrigerator. If you think it might be a while till you make a beef bone broth, you wanna go ahead and save your marrow bones in the freezer. Now the marrow inside the marrow bone is very soft at this point. And depending on 
exactly how the marrow bone is cut, you might be able to push it, push it through the bone, just like what I'm doing here. And if for any reason this end was blocked, you can just scoop it out. I find the, the handle of a spoon, I just have like a table teaspoon here, works very well. Sometimes a butter knife works well too, uh, if, if the opening is wide enough to ac ac accommodate <laughs> the butter knife. Now, why are we saving this? First of all, and oh, I just wanna mention before I explain why, see some of this marrow bone still has some like cartilage and sinew attached to it. And this is gonna be wonderful to throw into your next batch of bone broth because this will continue to dissolve and help add to the gelatinous nature of your bone broth. Now, why do we save the marrow? Marrow, beef bone marrow is extremely nutrient dense. This is one of the ultimate nutrient dense foods. And what you can do with this, especially if you make the traditional French onion soup that I'll show you how to make next time, you can spread this on a toasted baguette. It's so tasty and it's a wonderful accompaniment to that type of soup. Next, you can also put this into any type of pureed soup or a cream soup. It's gonna add a real nutrient dense boost and it's gonna add that umami flavor. If you've never had bone marrow, uh, specifically beef bone marrow, it is a cross literally between steak and butter and it's often referred to as steak butter. And traditional cultures would even call it like a food of the gods and these type of things, you know, use these type of expressions because it is so good for you, but it's also actually really tasty. But I understand that if you're new to bone marrow, the initial appearance of it uh, may, it, it may be slightly off-putting. Once you learn to love it, you're gonna wanna eat it right off the spoon. But I highly recommend that if you're new to it, first disguise it maybe in a pureed soup or a cream soup, you really won't notice uh, much difference overall other than maybe that little bit of umami that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but you may even want to just try it on a little bit of toasted baguette. You may be pleasantly, actually not may, I'm confident you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Well, I've extracted out all the bone marrow best that I could. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the refrigerator. Now, if you're not going to eat the bone marrow right away, plan to only keep it in your refrigerator about a day two at the most. Uh, it, it, it's best if it's eaten right away, uh, but if not, definitely within a day or two. Otherwise, go ahead and freeze it. I've also separated all of the marrow bones as well as the bones that came out of the shanks. Uh, be sure to save these as well. These all should go into your fridge or your freezer and then into your next batch of bone broth. And I'll have in the printed recipe over on my website, or the link will be in the description below, I'll have all the times as to how long these things can be refrigerated, how long they can be in the freezer, uh, stored in the freezer, and so on and so forth. But see, there is so much wonderful cartilage and whatnot all around these marrow bones that are gonna be wonderful for your bone broth. Okay, now, as to the meat, pick out all of the meat and go ahead, as I mentioned, don't waste anything. Use this in casseroles, uh, tacos, soups, a nice beef barley soup. It's a very tasty and tender, falling off the bone tender, as they say. And as to the vegetables, you can puree those, put them into a soup, use them as a thickener. There's a lot of things that you can do with that. You could even just puree the vegetables, add in your bone marrow, and make a wonderful nutrient-dense soup. Now at this point, you have a couple of options. What I like to do is go ahead and use my fat separator. If you've been with me for a while and you've seen me make bone broth, you know that I love this thing for defatting my bone broth. And it's also perfect for defatting a brown beef stock like this. Alternatively, 
you could strain this first, which I'm going to show you how to do, and get out all the little bits and bobs, and then put it into your refrigerator, let it cool overnight. In the morning, the fat will have congealed on top and it's very easy to remove. Beef fat of this type it will be quite solid and quite hard uh, when you take it out of the refrigerator, so you can score it with a knife and lift it right off. What I like to do is simply go ahead and defat my stock now, then go ahead and strain it so that it's nicely clarified, clarified not in the chef sense, but clarified in the sense that all the little bits and bobs are no longer floating around in it. Now when you go through this process, if you have a large measuring glass measuring cup like this, or if you have a glass bowl, uh, whatever the case may be will work fine. You'll see exactly what we're going to do. Uh, just make sure that it is heat proof because we are working uh, at still it's a relatively hot liquid. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this into my fat separator and you will see the fat is going to float to the top. But the fat separator has a little handle here and when you depress that, a little hole opens up down on the bottom and you can strain out all of your broth and leave the, flat, <laughs> leave the fat that's floated to the top behind. Now, don't throw out that fat. That fat is very flavorful and since it comes from meat, beef, it also uh, has a very high smoke point. So it's wonderful uh, for sautéing, frying, uh, a lot of different purposes. And it's not exactly tallow. Uh, if you've seen my video where I show you how to render tallow from suet, suet is a specific type of beef fat that's around the kidneys of the cow. But, uh, and it's very odorless, flavorless. This will have flavor to it and will be, a, it, it's, it's firm if refrigerated, but at room temperature, it's a little softer than how tallow is at room temperature. Uh, but it's still very useful and it'll have a lot of flavor. So don't discard it. Now, brown beef stock, as the name implies, is quite brown. It's a little difficult to see and the whole simmering process and all does make the fat appear dark as well, but hopefully, and as well as the roasting part in the oven, but hopefully you can see the fat that has risen to the top. Now, what we're gonna do is depress this little button here, and as I said, this is gonna open a little hole down on the bottom here, and I am just going to let this brown beef stock go down into my bowl or my measuring cup until I see the fat reach the bottom of this fat separator. And then I'm going to go ahead and stop. And I'll decant the fat into a different vessel. Now I'm going to decant my beef fat down into this little container. Now it's not an exact science. We'll start to see the fat float to the top and there will be a little bit of beef stock down on the bottom there. And then when I'm all done with all of this, I may need a bigger jar actually, uh, I'll re-defat this again to capture that little bit of stock that's down on the bottom. Alrighty, now let's get ready to do our next batch. Alrighty, fat's risen to the top and now we'll get our second batch here. And that's it. This is, we'll see if we get maybe eight cups or so. I'm not 100% sure how much we'll get out of this. And it will vary every time. You know, a lot has to do with how much evaporates as it's simmering. Alrighty, well, not quite, but maybe about eight cups. It looks wonderful. The next thing I like to do is get a nice big bowl, put a colander over it, also, if you, have, if you have a mesh strainer, that's fine too. And then what I like to do is get a flour sack towel. Now, if you don't have these, you can certainly use cheesecloth if you have that. Uh, but these are very affordable. I usually find them at like the big box stores. Uh, and they seem to just last forever. They're easy to clean and they're wonderful for straining stock, broth, and bone, bo bone broth. So now let's go ahead 
and just pour this through our colander lined or with cheesecloth and it's going to get out all the little last bits and bobs so to speak. Yeah, see all this debris that's down here on the bottom. And then what I do is just kind of work it around because the colander is here. This is a good example. You can really see, see all the little debris that it picks up. So technically we're not clarifying the way a chef will with egg whites and there's some sort of process involved. It's not something that I do. I just strain it through. I strain my bone broth and my stock just through, or specifically this type of stock, my uh, beef brown stock, and I just, or my brown beef stock. <laughs> I just like to do this so that I have something that is beautifully, in my humble opinion as a home cook, clarified. So now we've got all of this, these the little, I call them bits and bobs, and it's just kind of mushy, and it would just make uh, our stock or our bone broth, if we were making bone broth, it would just make it kind of a little gloopy on the bottom and not nicely clear. And with what we've got here, we can do so much with this now, and it's easy to work with, and there's no debris in it. Plus, okay, we've got our bone marrow here. We've got our beef fat here. Wonderful, you fry up some potatoes, so much you can do with that. We've got our bones for a, a future batch of beef broth, plus we've got meat and vegetables here to use in recipes. So don't discard anything. It's all very usable in the traditional foods kitchen. Now, to store this, I like to store it. This isn't exactly one cup, but I like to store my stock in portions about this size as well as this size, depending on what I'm planning on using uh, to make with it. And then if I'm going to use these pretty quickly, I'll put them in the refrigerator, uh, defatted like this. It can stay fresh. People will say about a week. Uh, sometimes I think that might be pushing it a little. Uh, but, you know, say five days, you know. And in the, if you have the fat cap on it, if you've not de uh, defatted it and you've left the fat in place, that makes a nice seal and it will often stay fresh a little longer. The general rule is two weeks. Uh, it really depends. You kind of, I always think, use it a little before uh, the two-week period ends, and the same with putting it in the refrigerator without the fat cap. Use it, you know, before the week actually rolls around. And this is just going to be glorious. We'll take a little taste too. I'll go get a tasting spoon. But this is exactly how I store it. Now, I also like to freeze this and I leave, I usually leave a good inch or so headspace. But the nice thing about these jars, these are, I think they call them like French working glasses or French jelly jars. These lids, if for any reason you accidentally overfilled it and you put this in the freezer and it froze and expanded, it just pops the lid off. Nothing breaks, nothing cracks, which is really nice about these. But yes, you can also use certain types of canning jars. I know I've heard from many of you, you, you will put broth and stock uh, and bone broth in your freezer in canning jars and you just leave an appropriate headspace and all of that. How about home canning this? I generally don't recommend pressure canning this, which is how you would have to pressure can, how you would have to can it. It would need to be pressure canned as opposed to water bath canned. The problem is this is going to be beautifully gelatinous and if you pressure can it, you in essence break the gelatin. The extended period of having this in the pressure canner at a high temperature will hurt the gelatin. Uh, and we really want to try to preserve the gelatin as much as we can. So can some, yes, for an emergency, but generally I recommend refrigerating it or freezing it. Well, I was able to get two large containers and one small one of the brown beef stock, so I'm all set. Now let's give this a taste and see how it came. Mmm. Oh, that's going to be perfect for making sauces as well as traditional French onion soup. Now, if you'd like to learn how to make broth, 
more stocks as well as bone broth and a whole variety of them using poultry and pork as well as beef and fish too, be sure to click on this video over here where I show you how to make all of those and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.